Well, good morning. Welcome to our worship service today. Uh, especially want to thank those who may be visiting, as well as those who are watching online today. Uh, great to have you all with us. If you are a first-time visitor, uh, we would like to invite you to find that white card that's in the pa uh, pocket of the chair in front of you and uh, to take that out sometime during the service and fill it out. Uh, that will give us a record of your visit and allow us to connect with you a little bit later in the week, answer any questions you may have about the church, get some information into your hands. So if you would uh, fill that out, put in one of the offering plates on your way out, uh, that, would be, that would be great. I have a few announcements that I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, tonight is the last night of our series, uh, Rules of Engagement. Um, we're going to be talking about the fact that we, we know as Christians that when others mistreat us, we're not supposed to respond in kind. We're not supposed to mistreat others if they mistreat us. But the question becomes, does that mean that God just wants us to sit back and do nothing, to be a punching bag? And the answer to that is no. So uh, to find out what God wants us to do, I'd like to encourage you to come back uh, this evening. Uh, also, uh, today is the day that uh, we are making available the uh, budgets for uh, the 2021 year. Uh, the packets are available out in the foyer. Uh, it has both the general fund budget and our mission budget proposals that we'll be voting on at our annual business meeting on the 14th. Um, you'll also see in this packet an agenda for our annual business meeting, uh, the clerk's annual report, uh, the uh, auditor's report, and also year-end uh, financial documents. So we do want to encourage you, whether you're a member or a regular attendee, to pick up one of these packets uh, to familiarize yourself with this information and start asking questions. Uh, you can email or call one of the pastors if you have questions about anything in this packet. And uh, we also will have an informational meeting following the uh, morning worship service next Sunday uh, to, again, uh, in a setting like this to give you the chance to ask any questions that you have. Now, if you look at the agenda for the annual business meeting, you'll see that there's more involved than just voting on the budgets. And so we're not going to allow for questions that day, but you've got two weeks to ask any question that you want. And there are no bad questions, only the question that could have been asked that wasn't. So I encourage you to look it over, ask any questions that you have, and participate in the information meeting next Sunday. Also, this Friday is our opportunity to participate in Together We Pray, and uh, we encourage you as a church to pray for Haiti, to pray for our church, and pray for our government and our nation, and I encourage you to take some time to do that this Friday. Why don't you uh, pray with me as we begin our worship service together. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of gathering as your people. We recognize that the only reason that we're here is because you took the initiative uh, to draw us to yourself and to um, allow us to have a, a relationship with you. And so as your people, we gather together to express our love to you and our appreciation for who you are and what you've done and also to hear from you today so that we can um, uh, be obedient to that which you've commanded and live lives that are honoring and pleasing to you. So we do ask, Lord, that you would be honored by what takes place here today um, as we set aside any distractions uh, and choose to focus on you and um, give you the praise and the adoration that you alone deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, good morning. When I came in, I heard someone say they thought it was a little chilly outside. Uh, but then I thought, this is all, this is where you have to go. Uh, the word warm in scripture is mentioned 19 times. Heat is mentioned 18 times. The sun is mentioned 176 times. So. That's all we need, and it's warm in here. It's great to see everybody this morning, although snow is mentioned 23 times also. So. I thank all of those who have provided information for our directory. You're making my job easier, and you're also ministering to everybody else in here. For those who have not provided it, I'm just going to encourage you to please do so uh, at your convenience. I have my camera. If you need your picture taken, I'll take it after service today. Uh, we would like to shrink wrap it. We're going to reach a point where it's a cutoff. Uh, we're not there yet, but uh, I would truly appreciate people uh, responding to that. Uh, in our evening service, uh, we always request uh, from the floor prayer requests. But if you're not able to come out this evening and you have a prayer request, you can email it to me and I will bring it up uh, this evening. Our offering basket is in the back. We do not pass the plates anymore, so please uh, be cognizant of that. Uh, and now let's open in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. 
Thank you for everything that's going on around us. Some of it, uh, I confess, I don't understand. Uh, but I know I don't have to understand because you have a plan, you are sovereign. But Father, give me the wisdom to take action and react to those items in accordance with your word that I need to be held accountable for. And again, thank you for this day, for each person in this room and the way they minister to me. In your name we pray, amen. Our reading this morning is Philippians 3, 4 through 11. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Thank you, Father, for your word.
As we get started this morning, I want to encourage you to do two things. Open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3 and also find the sermon notes inside your bulletin and, and take those out. Every believer has a testimony of how they came to faith in Jesus Christ. This is called a salvation testimony. And a salvation testimony consists of three parts. The first part is a, a description of life before conversion, which recounts a person's spiritual condition before they became a believer. The second part is a review of the specific circumstances leading up to conversion, which communicates how a person actually comes to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And the third part is a description of life following conversion, which explains how Jesus has made a difference in a person's life now that they have become a believer. And the circumstances surrounding our conversion differ from one Christian to another. There is, however, one aspect that is exactly the same for every believer. It is that we have received salvation in exactly the same way. Everyone is saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. And if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you can testify of how your life has completely turned around. No longer are you captivated by selfish pursuits. You are now one of Jesus' committed followers. And your testimony is the particular and unique story of how this transformation occurred in your life. Today we are continuing our study of the book of Philippians. And we're going to be looking at chapter 3, verses 4 through 11, the passage that Charlie read just a little while ago. And in these verses, Paul does not share his testimony with us, but he does summarize what his conversion experience taught him. He wants everyone to see how his life was radically changed by Jesus Christ. Before he met Jesus, Paul was running fast in the wrong direction. But after his encounter with Jesus, he immediately began running in the opposite direction. Last week, we saw how Paul warned the Philippians to guard themselves against the false teaching of the Judaizers. The Judaizers were a group of Jews who had embraced Jesus as their Messiah, but were teaching that Gentiles must be circumcised in order to be saved. And in no uncertain terms, Paul denounces their teaching, condemning it as a false gospel. And to counteract the Judaizers' claim that certain ceremonies and rituals of Judaism were necessary for salvation, Paul describes in these verses his own lofty accomplishments as a Jew, which were greater than those his opponents could claim, but were of no benefit for salvation. Look with me at verse 4. Paul says, Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks that they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. And Paul is going to go on to list seven facts about his life that more than adequately qualify him for a place in the covenant people of God, at least according to the Judaizer standards. The first four he came by naturally, and the latter three he earned by hard work. So let's look at these seven reasons why Paul could have put confidence in the flesh. Let's look at the first four, which are inherited privileges. Paul could have put confidence in ritual. In ritual. He says in verse 5, I was circumcised on the eighth day. Paul was circumcised by his parents eight days after his birth in strict compliance with the law of Moses. He probably mentioned circumcision first because it was a big issue for the Judaizers. And the, and the main point here is that Paul was not a convert 
to Judaism. He was a Jew by birth. And he had received circumcision as the sign of the covenant at an early age. Paul could have put confidence in his race. He says that he was of the people of Israel. As a pure-blooded Jew, Paul had a natural right to all the blessings and privileges promised, promised to all Israelites. Israel was the covenant people of God. They were the recipients of God's law. They had received instructions from God regarding temple worship, and they were in the lineage of the Messiah. Paul could have put confidence in his rank. He says, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. Paul came from a distinguished tribe. King Saul, Israel's first king, was a Benjamite. When the promised land was divided among the 12 tribes, Jerusalem, the holy city, was in Benjamite territory. When the kingdom split in two, the United Kingdom split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, only the tribes of Judah and Benjamin remained loyal to the Davidic dynasty. Paul could have put confidence in tradition. He says, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul was a Hebrew son born to Hebrew parents who retained their native tongue and customs in a pagan territory. Neither Paul nor his parents ever submitted to the influence of Hellenistic culture. He learned the Hebrew language and orthodox customs at an early age in his hometown of Tarsus. And all he, although he grew up in a Gentile city and learned both Greek and Aramaic, he did not become Hellenized as so many other Jews had done. Paul goes on to speak of three earned privileges in verses 5 and 6. He could, have, he could have put confidence in rule keeping. He says, in regard to the law, I was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were a legalistic and separatist group who strictly kept the law of Moses in the unwritten tradition of the elders. Although they were relatively few in number, the Jewish historian Josephus says they numbered about 6,000 in Paul's day. The Pharisees enjoyed the support of the people and influenced popular opinion, if not national policy. Paul was the son of a Pharisee and chose to follow in his father's footsteps. As a Pharisee, Paul devoted himself to the oral tradition developed around the law in an attempt to prevent any violation of its standard. Paul could have put his confidence in his sincerity. He says, as for zeal, persecuting the church. Paul persecuted the church because he thought Christianity was heretical and blasphemous. In the first century, Paul's zeal for persecuting the church had become well known. He treated Christians brutally, throwing them into prison and giving approval to their executions. And lastly, Paul could have put confidence in his ability to be uh, obedient to the law. He says, as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. Now, Paul isn't claiming sinless perfection, but he is saying that his life was exemplary when it came to obeying the Old Testament law. His public record of moral performance was stellar. These are the seven reasons that Paul gave for why he could have put confidence in the flesh. And in fact, at one point in his life, he did. Before his conversion, Paul falsely believed that his privileged background gave him a special standing before God. And now in verses 7 through 9, Paul gives his appraisal of both the seven items that he outlined in verses 5 through 6, as well as every other facet of his life in which he might have previously thought to be gain, spiritually speaking. The contrast between Paul's pre-conversion thinking and his post-conversion thinking is well highlighted by the strong adversative but. He says in verse 7, but whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
The term whatever takes in Paul's background and achievements in verses 5 and 6, but also includes anything he might ever have viewed as gain to his spiritual account. So let's consider Paul's losses. Using the figure of a balance sheet, Paul reckoned all of his assets, the privileges he had inherited and earned before Christ, as liabilities. Let's look at this balance sheet for a minute. This is what Paul is saying. He's saying, according, in my ledger, in my balance sheet, I took all of these privileges, all of these achievements, all of these accomplishments, and I put them on the asset side of my ledger. I considered circumcision, the fact that I was an Israelite and a Benjamite and a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Pharisee and zealous and moral, as something that put me in right standing with God. When God saw these things about me, he was pleased with me. But he says that after conversion, go to the next slide, he moved all of those things over to liabilities. He no longer saw them as an asset. He saw them as a liability. Why? Why would he do that? Well, it's not that any of these privileges or accomplishments that he lists in verses 5 and 6 and and other things like them were bad in and of themselves, quite the contrary. There's nothing wrong with being born a Jew. Indeed, it was a blessing to have been circumcised on the eighth day and reared in a devout Jewish home. It was a tremendous privilege to belong by birth to the nation of promise and descend from one of the most famous tribes within it. The fact of his zeal, although misguided, is admirable in itself. And so is the upright life that he strived to live. The problem is not with the things in themselves, per se, but rather with Paul's approach to them and what he hoped they'd accomplish before God. Being Jewish doesn't save anyone. Because Paul had been trusting in his Jewishness, for salvation, instead of trusting in Jesus, this asset of being Jewish had become a liability so far as salvation is concerned. And the same principle applies outside of Judaism. Being wealthy is an asset. I don't know of many people who would prefer poverty over wealth. But if you trust in the uncertainty of riches, or if your riches are more important to you than God, then your wealth has become a liability so far as salvation is concerned. The same thing could be said about position and power or intelligence or education or having been raised in a Christian home. Whatever becomes a substitute for faith in Christ is a liability. Look at verse 8. Paul says, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Paul says, I consider it garbage. All those things that were assets that I moved over to the the liability common. I consider all of those things garbage. They they had become abhorrent to him. Not because they were bad, because they, they weren't. They weren't bad in and of themselves. But they had kept him from Christ. And so he does not begrudgingly give up these things. He joyfully casts them aside. I don't weep when the trash men come up and pick up my garbage. It's because I don't want that stuff anymore. And that is the way that Paul views anything that competes with being in a right relationship with God. Get rid of it. I don't want anything to do with that anymore. Let's consider Paul's gain. Paul has spoken about those things that he once looked upon as assets, but has now come to see as liabilities. What is it then that Paul now considers to be his assets? And he only has one. Christ. My only asset, Paul says, is Jesus Christ. My relationship with him. That's what I'm trusting in. 
to have a right standing with God, who Jesus is and what he has accomplished for me. Instead of relying on his own self-righteousness for salvation, Paul learned that, like us, that he needed someone else's righteousness in order to be justified before God. Because here's the problem. Only righteous people are going to heaven. But none of us are righteous. Therefore, we need another source of righteousness if we're going to get to heaven. We need God's righteousness. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God made him who had no sin. Who's Paul talking about here? Jesus, right? God made Jesus to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What, what a glorious exchange. What a great exchange. Christ received our punishment though he never sinned. And we receive his righteousness, though we didn't deserve it. And consequently, we are found in Christ. That means that God sees us and relates to us through the righteousness of Christ. Believers are now protected from judgment. And we can know that we have forgiveness from God and are accepted by God. No better news exists in the whole world than that. And Paul quickly makes two important points regarding this justification. And, and just for clarity's sake, when, when I speak of justification, and, and it is a biblical term, I'm, I'm talking about this God's declaration to the believing sinner where he says that I will treat you just as if you have never sinned against me and just as if you have always obeyed my commands. That is a legal declaration that allows us to have a right relationship with God. And this is what Paul has to say about justification in these verses. He says that justification is a gift from God. He says that in verse 9. He says that I, I want to be found in him with the righteousness that comes from God. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. But God, in his infinite grace, gave his only son to live and die for law-breaking people like you and me, that we might be saved. Paul goes on to say that justification is received by faith. Again, in verse 9, he says, Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. So I can't say this enough. Salvation doesn't depend on your record, your rank, your ethnicity, your worship service attendance, or your good deeds. It depends solely and completely on faith alone and Christ's perfect work alone. Justification is God's work, secured by Christ's death and appropriated by faith. And, and one more thing that I'd like to say about justification Justification is what separates Christianity from all the other religions in the world. It's true. In all other religious systems, you have to do the work to earn God's favor. You have to perform good works. You have to perform religious ceremonies and rituals. And maybe, just possibly, God will be pleased with your efforts and you can get on his good side and he'll do some things for you. But that is not the message of Christianity at all. In Christianity, you don't have to do the work because Jesus has already done it for you. And all you need to do is trust in him and that completed work that he completed on your behalf. Now, while the focus in verse 9 is primarily on justification, verse 10 moves in the direction of sanctification, Paul's present life with Christ, and he gives us four aspirations that he has for the Christian life. He says at the beginning of verse 10, I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And obviously, at the time that Paul wrote this letter to the Philippians, he already knew Jesus. He, he already had a relationship with him. He, he had already been saved. 
So here, Paul isn't talking about coming to know Christ for the first time. He's talking about gaining a deeper knowledge of and a deeper intimacy with Jesus. Because of his love for Jesus, he longed to know him more. And and those of us who have people in our lives that we love, we understand that, right? That we're not satisfied with a surface knowledge of that person. That it's an ever, we have this desire to have an ever increasing knowledge of them that grows deeper and deeper so that we really know the heart of that person. And that was where Paul was coming from. I want to know the heart of Jesus. I long to know him in that way. Do you have a desire to know Jesus intimately? to awaken with him in the morning and to live each day with him in your presence? If you can't honestly say that that's where you're at, uh, humbly come before God and admit it. Say, that should be my desire, Lord, but it's not. Give me that desire. Give me that kind of heart that longs to know you in this way. God will answer a prayer like that. I'm confident of that. Second, Paul says that he desires to experience Christ's resurrection power more fully. He says in verse 10, I want to know the power of his resurrection. To know Christ intimately is to experience the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection is God's power, his life-giving power that he deployed in raising Jesus from the dead. And this same power is available to every believer. It's astonishing, but it's true. Paul prayed this in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. He's praying for the church. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know his incomparably great power for us who believe. And that power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in his heavenly realms. And so we have access to this resurrection power. How how do we gain access to it? We gain access to this power through the Holy Spirit who indwells us. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8. Verse 11, he says, And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. And you're probably thinking right now, if you're a believer, this is awesome, Rex, because I want to be able to raise people from the dead. I want to be able to perform mighty miracles and signs. And so let's have a revival service and let's bring in the lame and the crippled and let's heal them. We've got access to this resurrection power. Let's use it. But that's not what Paul is emphasizing here. Look what he has to say in the next two verses in Romans 8. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, in light of the fact that we have access to this resurrection power by the Spirit, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Do you see it? This access to resurrection power is not to give us the ability to perform signs and wonders, but to put sin to death in our lives. And above all, Paul wanted to experience the resurrection power of Jesus Christ over sin daily as he strived to live a holy life before God. And I'm saddened to say that many Christians today appear to live powerlessly, especially when it comes to overcoming sin in their life. They live as if they were defeated Christians. How many times have I heard someone say, Pastor Rex, I'm just struggling with this sin. I keep going back to it again and again and again, and I just don't seem to be able to get any victory over that sin. 
And if that's you this morning, I just want to remind you that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, that God's resurrection power is available to you to help you to conquer the sin in your life if you would but access it. Now, we know that the power comes by the Spirit who lives within us, but how do we access it, spiritually speaking? The Holy Spirit works through the Word of God. And so, how do we access that power? We go to the Word of God to get an understanding of what God has to say about overcoming sin in general. And then we even look at particular passages of Scripture that deal with the sin that we're wrestling with. And we see what God has to say about it, and we believe his promises related to the help that he provides, and we choose to act in obedience to the things that he's commanded related to that sin. And we do these things while depending on the Holy Spirit within us to empower us to have victory over that sin. And so, resurrection power is available to every one of us who considers ourselves to be a believer in Jesus Christ if we would but access it. Third, Paul says that I desire to respond well to suffering more regularly. He says, I want to know the participation in his sufferings, in Christ's sufferings. Another way to know Christ intimately is to share in his suffering. When Paul uses the phrase participation in his sufferings, he's not referring here to our participation in Christ's sufferings on the cross, as if somehow our sufferings could contribute to Christ's atoning work. Only Jesus can save us from our sins. So no, Paul here is expressing his desire to stand with Christ in such an indivisible union that when the abuses and persecution that Christ suffered also fall on him as he knew that they would, that he would receive them just as Jesus did. He wanted to react like Jesus for he knew that the abuse received like this would actually draw him closer to the Lord. And we try to avoid suffering in our lives. We don't want anything to do with persecution or mistreatment. But these trials that God allows into our life are for the purpose of bringing us closer to Jesus. When things are going well, we tend to rely on our own resources and focus on the temporary things of this life. But when we are faced with persecution and mistreatment and sufferings, we recognize our need for God's strength and for his help and for his provision. And so we find ourselves going to Jesus because we know that we can't get through this trial without him. We are completely dependent upon him and when we do run to Jesus we always find him to be so faithful so good so loving so kind number four Paul says that he desires to prepare for the resurrection more readily or to prepare for eternity more readily here at the end of verse 10 and the beginning of verse 11 Paul has his eyes on his ultimate glorification He says, becoming like him, becoming like Christ in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Let's look at each of these statements for a minute. Um, When Paul uses the phrase, becoming like him in his death, he speaks to the nature of our struggle as people who are saved in the present, yet awaiting the full realization of our salvation in the future. When Christ died on the cross, all Christians died with him. And so we were set free from the power and the control of sin in our lives. And his death was applied to us when we first trusted in Christ as our Savior. We died with him so that he might live in us and through us. And because Jesus' death was a death to sin, Becoming like Jesus in his death means to die to sin in this life so that we will receive that resurrection to eternal life in the next. 
And then there's this strange phrase or statement at the end of verse 11 that brings a closure to this passage. He says, somehow, and so somehow, attaining to the resurrection from the dead. What in the world are you talking about, Paul? Well, he's not suggesting here that he doesn't know whether or not he will be resurrected. And I want to suggest, neither is he stating that he can't know for sure how he will be resurrected. Whether it will be after martyrdom, after a natural death, or after the rapture. One thing is, is certain, that Paul is confident regarding his future with the Lord. And he's confident that he will be resurrected, however that may play out. So the issue here is not the fact of the resurrection or the means of the resurrection. Paul here has been talking about, again, the issue of putting confidence in the flesh, trusting in one's own accomplishments and abilities to please God. And Paul knows his sinful nature. Paul knows his sinful heart. And so he still has a measure of healthy self-doubt about his ability to completely trust in Christ. And so he says that he really wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings. But he doesn't know that in his flesh if he would be, is going to be able to maintain such a pursuit. And so he needs to continue to trust Christ. And that is the somehow of attaining to the resurrection from the dead. This continued trust in Christ to keep working in his life, to help him to persevere and endure and to bring him to glory where Paul will experience his final and ultimate glorification. As we finish this morning, I just want to highlight three applications uh, from this text to our lives today. Number one, and I can't say this enough, trusting in human achievements prevents one from obtaining God's righteousness. Have you assumed that your natural or earned privileges will save you? Have you been an overachiever, religiously speaking, but deep in your heart you do not know for certain that your sins are forgiven and that you have eternal life? If that is you this morning, I urge you to do as Paul did, to cease trusting in your own efforts for salvation and to trust in Christ and his work instead. We cannot earn God's favor. Salvation is a gift that is undeserved and thus is graciously given to all who believe in Jesus Christ. And so I urge you to trust in Christ's work on your behalf. Number two, as long as a believer keeps clinging, even to the slightest degree, to his own righteousness, he cannot fully enjoy Christ because they simply don't go together. The one must be fully abandoned before the other can be fully appreciated. And so as a Christian, you may have trusted in Christ solely and completely to save you from your sins. But now, when it comes to living the Christian life, you've gone back to relying on your own abilities. You're, in a sense, to some degree, relying on your own righteousness to be able to live for Christ and to honor him and please him as a Christian. And if you're doing that, my suspicion is that when you fail, when you say, don't make time for devotions, or don't take advantage of the opportunity that God has given you to witness to someone, or that you've given in to that temptation to sin again, then when you do any of these things that you feel like God is now unhappy with you, that he's shaking his head in disgust and saying, what am I going to do with that person? They just don't get it. And I want to challenge you, brothers and sisters in Christ, stop thinking that way. Stop thinking that way. You can't earn God's favor as an unbeliever, and you cannot earn God's favor as a believer. And the good news is, you don't have to. 
You don't have to. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you already have favor with God because it doesn't depend on you. It never has and it never will. It depends completely on Christ's work done for you on the cross. And so whether you're having a good day spiritually or a bad day spiritually, it doesn't change how God views you or relates to you as his son or daughter. His love for you remains the same. And so trust in God's promise that Christ's righteousness has been imputed to you, that his righteousness is yours so that when God sees you, he doesn't see you as the sinner that you are, but he sees you as one who has never sinned against him and who always obeys him because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you. And on that basis, God the Father relates to you as his son and his daughter, and that won't change ever. And so with this promise in mind, live out your Christian life and let that be the motivation to serve him, to live for him, to be faithful to him. Only then will you fully enjoy and appreciate the beauty of God's righteousness. And then lastly, one of the main goals of the Christian life is to know Jesus and to be like him. It's not primarily to have a successful ministry and to change the world. It's not primarily to enjoy the sweet fellowship of other believers as we come together for worship. It is to know Jesus and to be like him. Is that your goal? Have you ever noticed that when you're looking to buy a new car, and and you have a particular make in mind that you suddenly see that make of car everywhere that you go, Uh, if you will set before you each week this goal to know Christ and to be like him, you will see opportunities all over the place to apply it. You will have temptations where you will need to rely on the power of the resurrection. You will face persecution and mistreatment and trials and sufferings where you will come to know what it means to participate in Christ's suffering as you run to him and depend on his strength and help and provision. You will encounter disappointments and irritations where you must learn to be more conformed to his death. And I want to encourage you to view all of these things as an opportunity to know Christ more deeply and more intimately and more personally. And to use these opportunities as a reminder that God is preparing you for that day when he comes again and that you will be raised up with him in glory for all eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this tremendous passage of Scripture that speaks of the great exchange where we exchange our self-righteousness, which will get us nothing, get us nowhere, for Christ's righteousness that gives us everything when it comes to a relationship with you. And so help us to be willing to set aside anything, anything that we may be putting our confidence in to find favor with you, anything in and of ourselves, but that we would trust in the completed work of Christ on our behalf and receive the righteousness that you offer us as a gift by faith. And Lord, as we experience that and enter into a new life with Christ, I pray that we who are believers would live out that truth every single day. 
with the reminder that it, living the Christian life doesn't depend on us either, but on the work that Jesus accomplished for us and, and the righteousness that we have in him. And because of that provision, help us to rely on you to live the life that you've called, called us to live. And as we see that power and work in our lives, that we would be filled with joy knowing that we belong to you and yet you are at work in our lives. Make us open to that, open our eyes, the eyes of our heart, even today to see these wonderful truths and to live them out in our lives. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please close our worship service with me. Father, I thank you for the words in the book of Philippians. And Father, I thank you for the joy that it presents to us. I thank you, Father, for the message from our pastor this morning. Now may we carry that message in our heart. May we pursue the goal of getting to know you better. And Father, we just have to open our eyes and the opportunities are all around us for us to display our love. We just need the desire, the acceptance, 
And Father, our will to apply what we have learned this morning. So I thank you, Father, as we leave here, may we not constrain this great power that we all possess through the Holy Spirit. And Father, I just thank you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen.